Thanks, Gene, and uh, thanks to all of you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I gotta say, when uh, he mentioned that I Uber drive, uh, and the applause happened, I couldn't help but imagine that most of you were just sucking up, having been in traffic on the way in here and are looking for a ride on the way home. I, uh, I, I do work tours all the time, actually, and we've just never had a press strategy around it, and it's pretty obvious that was a mistake. Uh, I've had a brand that's been tied to the Republican presidential nominee a lot for the last nine or ten months, not something that I was intentionally seeking. And had I known that I could just drive Uber, I would have gotten out of the doghouse. That would have been a really helpful step to take. Um, but for those of you who don't know, just for a minute, I, I want to talk today, tonight a little bit about why we shouldn't have Republican and Democratic categories on a whole bunch of the execution of law in the Article II branch. We shouldn't have Republican versus Democratic categories in judging. Uh, there are a whole bunch of places where we shouldn't have Republican and Democratic categories, so I don't want to assume that all of you are as market-oriented as I am, but I'm presuming that most of you are. Uh, one of the great things that I learned driving Uber this weekend, I do these work tours with Nebraskans for a bunch of reasons. Uh, one of them is that town halls, which I do a ton of as well, are not always totally representative of the public at large. The people who come to town halls tend to be a little more obsessively focused on politics and policy than the public uh, in general. And so if you do a work tour, uh, you get to be in a service posture toward people. You get to learn about different industries. But you also just get to talk to people in the course of their day-to-day -day life. And you learn things that are sometimes different than town hall meetings, which can be astroturfed. And so I do these town halls, but I also do them uh, because I have three little kids. My daughters are 15 and 12, my son is five, and uh, I, I'm one of only five people in the Senate that's never been a politician before. Uh, that, uh, as Gene mentioned, is maybe a good thing, uh, some lay governance sense of Tocqueville in America again. But I'm the only guy, I think, in the Senate that does a family commute. And if you're the only one doing something, it probably means you're a naive rookie and you're kind of a fool. And uh, I don't want to be away from my kids all day every week, but I also don't know where they would walk beans into tassel corn if we moved to Washington. So I live in Nebraska. I come back and forth every week, and I bring with me whichever kid mom is most sick of. <laughs> so usually we alter between the 12 and 15-year-old girls. This week I have the five-year-old son, and that's a whole new bag of worms to have, <laughs> have running around the Senate. He is not bashful about trying to ask questions at committee hearings in the Senate. <laughs> But when I do work tours at home, it's frankly a chance to make my kids suffer. Like we go and we feed cattle at five in the morning and I want them to have that sort of work ethic experience of having to get up and get out and do something when it's cold and you don't feel like doing it. Well, when I drove Uber this weekend, it's partly because I'm a nerd who's really interested in the disintermediation of different parts of the service economy. Um, and I wanted to talk to the kinds of consumers of Uber product, but I also wanted to get to know other people who were driving for Uber. Little did I know if you drive Uber on game day in Lincoln, which is what I did, you quickly find out that Uber has a market-oriented lever to make sure they have enough supply side for the bar district on weekend nights. If you throw up in an Uber, you will be charged $150. <laughs> and this is because the contractor is driving his or her own vehicle. So I've, I've learned a lot uh, of driving Uber that may seem like it's not directly relevant. But in certain ways, I think it is relevant to a little bit of what we want to talk about tonight. Before we do that, though, I want to say directly in front of 600 of his closest friends um, what a privilege it is uh, to get to follow Ted Olson in this le lecture um, by 15 years and to be able to be here celebrating uh, Barbara. She was an incredibly special, thank you. She was an incredibly special woman, and even if you were somebody like me who didn't really know her, I met her in, in social circles in passing two or three times, but, but didn't really know her at all, but knew her larger-than-life personality and her convictions and her commitment to trying to persuade other people about the American idea. Um, she is a, an impressive person, and to be able to honor her legacy and speak tonight is a true honor. And I began to write some notes about her um, and as a tribute to her, and then frankly, I realized that what I was going to say probably wasn't quite as meaningful um, as being able to give you all a reminder of what you heard last year. I read some of the lectures uh, that preceded tonight's, and last year when Tom Cotton uh, gave his lecture, he talked about this guy that he referred to as Susan Davis for a while, which is the stage name of the woman now known as Anna Cotton. Uh, 
And Anna Cotton is from West Point, Nebraska, about 30 minutes from where I live. It's a, one of the largest cattle counties in Nebraska. Nebraska is actually the largest cattle state in the Union, so take that, all you Texans. Uh, <laughs> and Anna, when she got to uh, the Cardozo uh, Law School at Yeshiva University, she got there and found this institution called the Federal Federalist Society. There was a chapter there that made a big impact on her life. And Tom, who like me, barely knew Barbara, is married to a woman, and as he put it, the woman who's the mother of my son, and she was formatively shaped because of things and investments that people had made before, and that those people are you all. There are now 60,000 alums, I believe, of Federalist Society chapters over the course of the last, uh, what would our math be now, uh, 36 years, 35 years, um, and Anna, benefited from the fact that Barbara had been the founder of the, that chapter at Yeshiva. And Tom said this. He, he gave a bunch of personal detail, and then he got to the place where he discussed character that invests in future generations. And he gave this beautiful, um, long paragraph summary of Aristotelian habit formation. And he said this about someone like Barbara. Aristotle, the first great teacher of character, wrote a lot about character formation. And the only way to develop character is the hard way. In other words, there is no royal road. The way of making each choice each day for a thousand days and then for another thousand days, the way of listening to one's conscience when pleasure beckons or pain repels, or of developing one's judgment to see the good both in the circumstances immediately present and in the eternal truths. Aristotle teaches that true virtue isn't merely knowing the good, but doing it also, for he says, we are not studying in order to know what virtue is, but to in fact become good, for otherwise there would be no profit in this. The key to character development for Aristotle is practical wisdom, the ability to observe circumstances combined with knowledge and right principles to reach sound judgments in moral matters. It is the habitual exercise of practical wisdom in every situation that leads to virtue. But he says this as well. To do this to the right person, to the right extent, at the right time, with the right motive, and the right way, this is not for everyone, nor is it always easy. Wherefore, goodness is both rare and laudable and noble. Let us applaud the fact that that character was barbarous. There are a whole bunch of reasons why it's daunting uh, to stand in front of a group as august and learned as this, not least of which is that I'm not an attorney. So I join with you in the cause that the Federalist Society has been fighting for for 35 years, um, but I don't have your training. And so there are a whole bunch of places where I can step in potholes. And by background, I am a business turnaround guy. I'm a historian by training, and I was a college president for five years before running for this office. But for most of my 25 adult years, I've worked at places like McKinsey and the Boston Consulting Group and a private strategy consulting firm that I had. And I've gone into organizations that are a mess and been a part of helping leaders and boards ask questions about whether or not their institution is accomplishing what it set out to accomplish. Maybe it should be retired. Maybe your venture philanthropy project succeeded at its mission. Maybe its mission is, was written for a time 10 years ago and it didn't succeed, but it doesn't make sense anymore. Sometimes institutions need to die, and cultural pluralism enables that kind of trial and error and experiment in voluntary organizations, and that's a good thing. And so I actually came here tonight uh, to speak primarily about successes that FedSoc has had and some adjacent problems that are not a criticism of FedSoc, but a larger cultural problem that I would refer to as the crisis of cultural catechesis. The fact that we have been raising for 40 or 50 years now a couple of generations of American orphans in the sense that President Reagan used to warn that in any free republic, you're always only one generation away from the extinction of freedom. If you don't pass on the meaning of America to the people who need to be ruling America, because we don't believe in the rule of professional, permanent, expert, incumbent class, 
If the people who are supposed to be ruling America in 10 and 20 and 30 years don't understand what America is, if they don't understand the American idea, then freedom will slip away. And we have, for nearly half a century, stopped to discuss who we are as a people. We don't have a shared understanding of these things. And that is not precisely federal, the Federalist Society's mission. And so I was going to give you a brief history of the Federalist Society and celebrate some of those high moments over the course of the last 35 years, um, partly as a way to laud you, but partly as a way, frankly, to have focused my preparation. I wanted to learn more. And so as a former professor, I, I learn selfishly, and then I have this excuse, which is an audience. And so I. <laughs> I was headed toward teaching you a little bit of history, the history of the Federal Society, reminding you of it, and then I was going to, by analogy, talk about religion in the early modern period. And I say that because I'm an academic historian and my mom believes I wasted all my years in New Haven and I have to prove her wrong at least once a year. <laughs> so I manufacture a reason to give a his history lecture. I also think there are probably a whole bunch of cultural and religious pluralism jokes I could make as a Protestant at a time when the Supreme Court has a vacancy and my people are unrepresented on the court. <laughs> I, I had a disparate impact joke, and I had an affirmative action joke, but I'm going to spare you all of that. But there's a really important thing uh, that happened in the 10 years after the Reformation. And so the Reformation starts as an intellectual debate about how people are saved, and theologians are debating it, and they're debating it in Latin, and they're debating it in a specialized institution that is a hierarchical church. And yet, so 1517 to 1520, 21. And yet, by the 1570s and 1580s, there's a Reformation movement and a Counter-Reformation Catholic movement that are both heavily involved with catechizing laity. And how you went from the one, an intellectual debate among clergy in Latin, who have the same job in the same institution, to a mass movement, relates to a moment in the 1527-1528 period when Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, 10 years in, had assumed the debates that he was having, especially since they were taken to the vernacular, were surely reaching the people. And then he left Wittenberg, and he left academic lectures, he left Federalist Society conferences, <laughs> and he went out into Saxony and he started interviewing some pastors and some moms and some dads and some 14-year-old kids. And he came to the conclusion that they don't have any idea what we're talking about. This movement is not actually penetrating. It's having political implications. It was sort of reordered. The world was being turned upside down in a whole bunch of ways about the people who might elect the next Holy Roman Emperor. But it wasn't reaching the masses. And so the catechism movement starts in 1528 and 1529. And what I had come to originally speak about was that. I was going to talk about the difference between the movement that you've been so successful at, the fact that before 1981 at Yale and in 1982 at the conference that brought 200 law students from 20 law schools, in 1985 when uh, General Meese addresses the ABA and he talks about original intent, and then the debates that follow in the next three or four or five years that sort of migrate orthodoxy for most of you from original intent to original public meaning and then all the jokes we get to have about how legislative history doesn't matter. <laughs> and, and you go through this moment where we get to a place where think how stunning it is that when Justice Kagan is at her confirmation hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee a couple years ago and she proclaims we disagree with her about what she thinks she means when she says it, but it's a pretty stunning thing about the success, about the founders and the nurturers and the investors in this movement that Justice Kagan would say, we are all originalists now. She said, we are all originalists now. Now, we don't think she really gets it. <laughs> and yet, you can't just say that texts are irrelevant. That's an unbelievably interesting and fascinating thing. But as I was thinking about what I was going to say, I'll admit, um, my skepticism about the nominees of both of the parties over the course of the last six to nine months didn't have anything to do with speculation about how the election would turn out. The, the concerns I had about executive restraint in both political parties, but I'll admit that I was surprised by the outcome last Tuesday night. 
And I realize that there are all sorts of new moments of opportunity because of this that aren't just because there are a bunch of policy preferences going to be advanced by President-elect Trump that I appreciate a lot more than the policy preferences that would have been advanced um, by Secretary Clinton, and not just because I think it's highly likely that his first nominee for the court will come from that list of 21. Those are two really great things. But I also think there might be a new moment of opportunity, and I'd like to explore with you a little bit tonight about what the opportunity for lay catechesis, for American citizenship, might be in the strange time into which we're now entering. But I didn't pivot what I'm going to talk about because I thought of that on my own. And here I'll admit a little bit of butterflies to say this. Um, I'm pivoting what I'm going to talk about because of how many of you in this audience reached out to me yesterday or late last night or early today concerned about your own organization. How's it, what's it like to be the non-attorney giving the Barbara Olson lecture and then say, hey, by the way, you all need to do some serious introspection. <laughs> you, have, you have two big and really important projects that are on the agenda for FedSoc and that you've talked about. You've talked about the Article I project, and you've talked about regulatory reform, and you've got a standing mission to serve as gatekeepers of the kinds of people who should be on the federal bench. In all sorts of fundamental ways, you are about advancing an organization that teaches at law schools across the country where not a lot of other people are advancing this vision, a founder's understanding of separation of powers, of limited government, of checks and balances, these are beautiful things that our people do not understand. Right now, current polling data shows that 41% of Americans under age 35, 41% of Americans under age 35 think the First Amendment is dangerous. Because you might use your freedom of speech to say something that would hurt someone else's feelings. That's actually quite the point of America. For those of you who need a trigger warning or who want to now flee to a safe space, let me, let me forewarn you. Our founders in Virginia, there were a bunch of materialistic commercialist folks, so we'll just, ignore, uh, we'll just ignore Jamestown and Roanoke a little bit. But by and large, the American founding was led by a whole bunch of people who differed about the nature of God and about heaven and hell and about how salvation might be achieved. And they came from a continent where people had been thinking for about a hundred years that you should kill each other if you disagreed about those things. <laughs> you should spill blood over those questions. Hear me clearly. I think those questions are critically important. I think those questions are more important than policy and politics. I also think the American experiment is the most glorious experiment in the history of the world because it takes seriously the human soul. It takes seriously conscience. It takes seriously persuasion. And the idea that if you differ about really big and important things, you can't solve that by bodily violence. So instead, we have this crazy idea that we will come together in a community. We will expand the domain or the reach as Madison would have said, to incorporate more and more people with more and more disagreements so we can get to a place where everybody understands themselves to be a creedal minority. And if every American understands that they're a creedal minority, because there's nobody that I ultimately agree with on everything, honey, if you're watching on C-SPAN except for you, <laughs> uh, but there's nobody that we're going to agree with on everything, and the founders were scared to death about the tyranny of the majority. And so they wanted to create a minority consciousness for all of us. And so the First Amendment, these great freedoms, which it's a laundry list, right? They're outside the document on purpose because our Constitution is glorious because it's a negative document. Freedom comes first. Natural rights comes for, come first. God gives us liberty. God created us with dignity. And we come together as a people to form a government as a secular tool to secure those rights. And so our Constitution enumerates the powers that the government gets, and the rights of the people are limitless. That's what the structure of the Bill of Rights is trying to tell us.
It's outside the document that will sort of reteach and recatechize our people on some of the most important things, and we'll run all the way to the Ninth and Tenth Amendment and sa that says, and by the way, if there were any enumerated powers that weren't expressly given to the federal government, only states and locals can exercise them. And oh, by the way, if there are a whole bunch more rights that we haven't talked about here, the people have all of those rights too. And we'll start the Bill of Rights with the most important top line freedom. And so what is the most important freedom? And the First Amendment, it's a dog's breakfast. It's religion, and it's speech, and it's press, and it's assembly, and it's the right of redress of grievances. And that means that all of you that sort of sold out on the cause and became lobbyists, you're still an important part of the First Amendment <laughs> of our Bill of Rights. And so those, let's hear it from the lobbyists. <laughs> Those freedoms are what the First Amendment is about. And the idea that any American could think the First Amendment might go too far means that we as a people haven't done the first things of teaching it. And the data is actually much worse than just something that you might think emanates from the campuses right now. The 41% of Americans under age 35 who think the First Amendment goes too far. If you ask the general voting public, if you ask the general voting public, can you name some of the freedoms in the First Amendment? What is the Bill of Rights about? What can you name? 57% can name freedom of speech. 57%. 19% name freedom of religion as a freedom that exists. And none of the other three freedoms of the First Amendment break 10%. Think about that. When you think of Benjamin Franklin ambling out of Constitution, now Constitution Hall in Philadelphia in 1788 and the little old lady in the, the maybe apocryphal story and comes up to him and says, Mr. Franklin, what kind of country did you give us? What kind of government have you built? And he says, it's a republic if you can keep it. I would hazard to guess that most of our founders who were in Philadelphia, if they knew the state of civic catechesis and civic understanding today, they might have made another run at George Washington about accepting that monarchy. <laughs> there are fundamental things that were not getting done, and they're a crisis. And I thought that I might be standing in front of you talking about this at a time when we were about to fill Justice Scalia's seat with some horrible super legislator who wanted a job that didn't require them to run for re-election. And I say, as somebody who lived on a campaign bus with three small children for 16 months, I did about 1,000 events, nearly 400 town halls. There was a whole bunch of two-year-old throw-up on that thing, and nobody paid me the $150 Uber charge. <laughs> it's not fair for some Democratic <laughs> nominee. to go and try and make law on the court without having to stand before the people for re-election. But the real reason it's not fair is because the people are supposed to rule. And policy is supposed to be made by the people through their elected representatives. And 435 of the 535 people that I work with are fireable always within 23 months and 29 days. It's a glorious thing. It's also glorious to have a six-year term. But <laughs> policy should be made in the Article I branch. Policy should not be made by unelected judges. Policy, except in the case of foreign policy emergency, is not to be made by the Article II branch, regardless of what color jersey the person is wearing who inhabits that branch. Some of you know the waters of the U.S. rule of the EPA, and essentially it's just a bunch of postmodern mumbo jumbo that says in the Clean Water Act, when it says there's an inter-intrastate distinction, we at the EPA would rather have lots more powers, and so we will obliterate the distinction between inter- and intrastate. In the county in which I live, in Nebraska, my county supervisors can't make their own decisions about road widening projects along a, a two-lane county road that has a man-made ditch next to it 
that is usually dry, and when it has water, the only water comes from a center pivot irrigation system that the farmer has erected there, because that is supposedly an interstate navigable waterway, and the EPA's reach now extends there. That is laughably absurd. I want to take a crane and put a speedboat in that ditch and have my kids stand behind it and I want to film a YouTube video of them crying that the skiing isn't working so well and I want to talk to the EPA administrator about how she can fix my problem. <laughs> and I was traveling Nebraska last summer as the WOTUS rule was about to be finalized and a rancher who was, you know, a larger than life Marlboro man and he was angry about the waters of the US rule and I was completely aligned with him on the issue and yet I still thought I might somehow die from this encounter. <laughs> and finally he goes from anger to resignation and he pivots and he says, you know what, I'm not just mad about this rule. You know what I'm really mad about? I'm mad about my memory because I keep racking my brain and no matter how hard I try, I can't remember who I voted for at the EPA. <laughs> I've heard readout from some of your CFPB panel today and uh, I think that King Richard should be fired. That's my personal view. Because these regulatory agencies are not in any way ultimately accountable to the people. And you all have two projects. You have an Article I project about the restoration of balance between the legislature and the executive branch. These are equal branches, but they are listed in an order, Article I, Article II, Article III, for a reason because they move from more policy making and therefore more democratically accountable to less policy making and less democratically accountable. Again, the, the 435 of 535 people can be fired every 24 months and most policy is to be made by statute. In the executive branch, the president has really important commander-in-chief responsibilities, and especially in times of emergency. But the president's job is less democratically accountable because there's only one time, if he or she stands for re-election, where you're again accountable to a judgment of the people. And the courts are to be making no policy, and therefore they have lifetime tenure. But if they were going to be a legislative, super legislative body, they should have to stand before the people. And we need to teach that again if we are going to, as Benjamin Franklin enjoined us, if we are going to succeed at keeping the republic. And many of you in this room, even though you don't talk about it much in polite company, are currently worried that the caricature of the left of those of us who say that originalism is not because of our policy preferences, it's not because of our preferred outcomes, it's because of our constitutionalism, it's because of our oath of office, it's because of our belief in the fact that policymaking should ultimately be accountable to the people, we say that we're not driven by outcomes. And yet many of you, I think, have said to me, that you're actually worried that the Article I project and the regulatory reform project might get that the regulatory reform project might get a momentum that doesn't stop at rescinding things that we think were passed with President Obama's pen and phone unconstitutionally, but might become a new power that's useful not just to destroy things that were wrongly accreted and built up, but to become a new policy-making tool. And that the Article I project, for all of our uh, supposed sincerity about having policy making go back to a legislature might have actually been because of the blue wall and the fact that there was a belief that Republicans who had won one quadrennial election since 1988, think of that at a popular vote level, since 1988 we were at a place where had Secretary Clinton won this election we would get to 2020 and you would have Americans in their 30s. Think of that. You'd have Americans in their 30s who would have seen one time when the Republicans won a popular vote since the Cold War. One time in their lifetime. And that was when the Democrats nominated a quasi-Frenchman in the aftermath of 9-11. <laughs> okay, that was a mistake. I didn't plan that. And, uh, <laughs> 
Note to self, uh, call Secretary Kerry to apologize. Um, if we're sincere about what we believe, it needs to be the case that we again remember what we thought two weeks ago, which was that we need checks and balances, that we need a separation of powers, that we need cultural catechesis for the next generation, that we need everyone, Democrat, Republican, or Independent, to know why it's a really, really troubling speech for a President of the United States who's taken an oath of office to say, it doesn't really matter if the legislature passed the laws I want them to pass. I've got a pen and I've got a phone. That was troubling when the guy who said it was a Democrat, and it will be troubling in 2020, and in 2024, and in 2028, and 2032, regardless of the partisan label of the person who occupies 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Here's the opportunity of the moment, though. The opportunity of the moment is, just as Madison envisioned a time where every American should think of themselves as a creedal minority and should go and want to defend other creedal minorities, no American should naturally aspire to be a part of some majoritarian coalition that wants to grow Washington and shrink the Tocquevillian centers of America where life is actually lived. The American impulse is to want to see those little platoons and to see the families and to see the Rotary Clubs and to see the churches and the synagogues and to see, as Tocqueville thought of it, as the Rotary Club, as the center of American life. He, when Tocqueville came here, remember, um, he was coming in the 1830s as a, essentially a travel reporter. We know, our kids know the birth date of America as July 4th, 1776, and we all think of this republic as having really been inaugurated effectively in 1788 or 1789, but Europeans at that time, they still saw us as religious zealots on the frontier of the earth, and that the British had just been distracted by having a drunk, crazy king, Hessian soldiers from Germany who didn't really want to fight much for their mercenary wages when it got hard, and distraction of battles with France. It isn't really until the War of 1812 that Brits and Europeans come to think of us as truly independent. And so we win our independence in their mind in the 18-teens for cultural pluralist and, and religious zealotry reasons, for ideological reasons, for intellectual reasons, for so philosophical reasons. Think about Margaret Thatcher's great line that European nations are born of history, but America is the only nation born of philosophy. By the 1830s, there is a thriving economy here. There is a market revolution. There's a putting out revolution in the way goods are being produced in more specialized ways. There's a canal revolution. There's the proto-railroad revolution coming. And Europeans can't make any sense of why this is happening. And so Tocqueville essentially comes here as a travel reporter to write back and explain to Europeans why this is such a glorious, dynamic place, not just with religious and cultural liberties, but with economic vitality. And he says, well, if you have a better economy than our countries in Europe, it must be because you have better bureaucrats. <laughs> and so he comes to Washington, D.C. because he's going to find the meaning of American dynamism, and he's sure that it must exist in the centers of power. It must exist in the capital. And he gets here and he says, actually, Washington, D.C. is a swamp with a whole bunch of people that aren't that creative. <laughs> Not a lot has changed. And, I don't know why, I, I know that we have you know, 10,000 current student members of FedSoc and 10,000 alums, but when you all clap and we're at the Mayflower Ho Hotel in Washington, I feel like we should just start a drain the swamp chant right now. <laughs> but Tocqueville says that the meaning of America that he found was when he went out to, there were then 25 states, and he goes to 17 of the states. And he says, I found the meaning of America. It's the Rotary Club. We Europeans had this idea that there's a continuum between isolated individualism and state-run collectivism. These Americans believe this crazy, glorious thing. These Americans actually believe in community. It isn't the case, Barney Frank, that government is just another word for those things we choose to do together. Government is another word for coercion. <laughs> 
there's some coercion that's necessary. <laughs> Government has important responsibilities. We are not anarchists. But community is the word for things we choose to do together. Voluntarism and persuasion are the words that show how American community is formed. Because if you want to persuade someone to marry you, if you want them to join your synagogue or your church, if you want them to buy your product, you don't go supplicate at the king and his court and try to get a charter to be the monopoly provider of that good or service. You go and build a better mousetrap and you learn how to sell it. You go on Shark Tank. And when we say the first institutions of American life are in the private sector, not in the public sector, we're not just talking about capitalism, though we are talking about that, but we're talking about not-for-profit ventures. We're talking about social philanthropy. And Tocqueville says we're talking about the Rotary Club. We're talking about blood, sweat, and tears of neighbors. People who actually believe they're trying to live out a life of gratitude by serving the people who live next door to them who will actually give their lives texture and meaning in all the ways that the Aristotle quote we read at the beginning said. All of the things that actually define happiness are driven by your family and your friends and your work and your, your belief system that you wrestle through with the people you actually know. Washington exists, this is the American idea, Washington exists to provide a framework for ordered liberty, not to root out dissent and disagreement, not to try to squash down on the difference of opinion we have, but rather to allow a thousand flowers to bloom and allow people to try to persuade their neighbors. And if we believe those things, then we want to do everything possible to take any occasion to teach the next generation that we aren't really about power. We're about a framework for ordered liberty so that love and persuasion in their communities is where they can live lives that truly flourish. And if we believe those things, we'd look for any opportunity to do that teaching. And we were scared that we were gonna have to do that teaching at a time when the political culture and the balance on the court would have drifted more and more toward a Washington-centric view of the world. We have a new opportunity. And many of you in this room will have special opportunities because many of you are about to go and serve our president-elect and you will be trying to do the very important work of helping him ably and dutifully pass the laws that have been passed by the Congress and to be prepared to be commander in chief all the time, but especially in times of crisis and emergency. And you will be raising your hands and swearing an oath to limited government. And when you swear that oath, you're about the project of continuing to depoliticize American life because that's what originalism was really about. We were trying to depoliticize the policy preferences of those who were unelected and serving in the administration of justice on the courts. Regulatory reform is about depoliticizing the execution of many complicated statutes. The attack on political correctness that did get a big vote of confidence in this election that all of us should be a part of is about depoliticizing conversation so that people can wrestle through real ideas instead of having to always be afraid of faux outrage about the fact that a lot of really complicated issues in life don't lend themselves to a 140 character tweet. Federalism that we'd like to see recovered is about depoliticizing the fact that many governance decisions that do need to be made by compulsion should be made across 50 laboratories of democracy so it can be closer to the people, so that you can have an experiment with what works and what doesn't work. Nebraska and Vermont, we have different people. We have different values. We have different problems. We have very different topography. We're going to feed the world, and they're going to make some really good ice cream. <laughs> but we shouldn't try. We should, and everybody from Burlington, it's a huge Fred, Fed Sock chapter. I would love to buy you a steak afterwards. Um, <laughs> we shouldn't try to solve every problem as the waters of the U.S. rule does. There are important interstate environmental and water issues that need to be solved in Washington, D.C., but every decision that doesn't have to be solved in Washington, D.C. should be driven back to the states. And so I'd like to close by having you think about when Tocqueville was coming here, what public discourse looked like in the form of school books, 
and in the form of public art to make sure that kids understood what came next. Think about, for those of you who've spent any time in Annapolis, think about what it meant when General Washington, in December of 1783, resigned his commission in Maryland, at the Maryland Senate, because the Continental Congress had been meeting there. And he came and he resigned his commission and that famous painting that still sits in Annapolis of President Washington, then General Washington, resigning his commission. That came out in 1824. Right up the street in Baltimore, the, the Washington Monument of Baltimore. We think, when we hear Washington Monument, we think of the one just a, a mile from us here, the 555-foot uh, statue tower that exists here. But the one in Baltimore is actually quite a bit more interesting. Because what, what did he say? What, what, what is on the top, for those of you who have ever been to the Mount Vernon neighborhood in Baltimore, and there's this 180-foot tower, and there's a 15-foot George Washington at the top. What is the artist trying to say with that piece of art? He has Washington wearing a Roman toga. And he's laying down his commission. It is, the, it is the scene that happened in Annapolis when Washington resigned his commission in 1783, and he's handing back the scroll, but he's wearing a Roman toga. Why? Because they knew the story of Cincinnati. They knew the dangers of Caesarism. They knew that when this guy, whose term as council was over, and he went back to growing cabbage, or whatever, forsaken vegetable it was. <laughs> and they came to get him and they said, will you be dictator? Their law allowed for a six-month dictator. This was a legitimate calling. And so he accepted the calling and he came back and he took up near limitless power, ostensibly for six months. They won the battle in two weeks. And Cincinnatus resigns his commission and tries to go back home. And the people say, no, 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 you should become dictator. And he says, no, that's not the law. And they said, but no one, would, no one would oppose it. You just had this glorious military victory. You did it in two weeks. No one will oppose you. And he says, no, we are a republic. And in a republic, we follow laws. And he goes back home. And American school kids in the 1820s and 1830s would have understood what that toga meant on that statue. The most vivid picture the most vivid symbol of freedom and of natural rights and of individual liberty that exists in iconic form anywhere on this globe is the Dome of the Capitol. And when you're in the Dome of the Capitol, there are three famous paintings, yet there's usually only two that we talk about. There is the, declaration, the committee drafting the Declaration of Independence, and there is the surrender of the British at Yorktown. And both of these paintings are filled with drama. You can hear the trumpets and the drumbeat as you look at them. The world has been turned upside down. They're filled with drama. And yet there's a third painting, and it is ridiculously humble and boring. It is a hand with a scroll. And that hand with a scroll is to shout out to the American people, that it isn't about this city. It isn't about the powerful. It is about the fact that we believe in a republic of laws and of limited government where those who serve in power want to embrace restraint. They want to embrace judicial restraint. They need and want to embrace executive restraint because the laying down of that scroll is another way of saying the center of the world isn't here and it can't be fixed here. It will be fixed in the communities where our people come from and where the meaning of America is passed on to the next generation. And all of those of you who will soon have the chance to go back into government, and those of us who will be cheering you on the outside as you take on that important executive branch calling, your jobs are not chiefly about the policy outcomes when you serve your new president. Your job is about the administration of justice because the checks and balances that you believed in two weeks ago and that FedSoc was founded about 35 years ago are not just your new callings when you take the oath, 
but you have this special new catechetical opportunity. Because when people stand up against power and they disagreed with that power, no one's surprised. They all expected that. What's glorious is when people believe in limited government and restraint when we are the ones in power. And we now have the opportunity to model that restraint. Thank you.